Welcome to On the Table, a podcast about board games, card games, and tabletop war games. Welcome back to episode 111 of the On the Table Gaming Podcast. I'm Chase, and today I'm joined by Brett Lanfer. Brett, thanks so much for coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having me again. I'm excited to talk to you because we got a lot of things coming down the line here. So this upcoming weekend, we've got the U.S. National Championships. You've got a an interesting list idea you want to pitch to us here. And today on the Facebook group, there were some reveals for some upcoming units that we can jump in and talk about as well. So let's let's just jump right into this. Let's jump into it. <laughs> okay. So, you know, with the U.S. National Championships this upcoming weekend, you know, kind of just big picture first, what do you think uh, events like this mean for A Song of Ice and Fire? You've got this and the the London GT, the big uh, London, uh, the, I guess it's the U.K., yeah, and it's it's also being picked up by um, competitive play. They've sent them a ton of prizes. There's a lot of hype going into that one because they've kind of built that one up for a while. But overall, the, both of the events, I think it's it's a really positive step because I think of all things, this community really needed to be able to get back into playing in person. I've said it so many times in you know a lot of the content creation that I do, but the first and foremost thing that this game is, is it's like a, it's a release for people, right? It's, yeah. At the end of the day, it's a game. It's an advanced game. It's got some competitive aspects because you're really using your brain a lot more than you do in some, some other board games and stuff. But this, this is a release for people. This is a hobby and the hobby side being so important to people. And then that break from reality being so important like that. It's just not the same when you're playing on TTS. You don't get to put your painted models. You don't get to, you know, see them in person and just kind of get a glance at the sculpts and you don't get that glorious battle feel. It's just not quite the same. So of all things, getting this back to play stuff, playing in person, getting back to your friendships, getting back to your communities and building those. That's the biggest implication of this is that um, Robert and Simon, they just seem like they are they are chomping at the bit to get some of these things kicked off. And then, you know, eventually I think they want to transition into regionals, into big, big, big finals. And, and maybe eventually we'll even get into some of these uh, worldwide, like kind of master's level events or just. Yeah worldwide events like we had with that paris event um it was right when i first got into the game they had that 100 person paris event so that's the exciting thing to me is is what the future can hold once organized play gets things rolling you know and you can start to really organize these 32 64 person gts and that's exciting for me i feel like you know for those of you who've been with us for a long time you may remember back to when simon first kind of revealed some of their big organized play ideas upgrades to their app tracking events and then everything just kind of ground to a halt and so i feel like this for me is like this is a glimpse of spring right where it's like things are starting to peak through the snow we're getting this first one up. We're going to have, uh, you know, the, there's events going on globally and we'll slowly start easing in where it's safe into these new events. And I'm, I'm excited. I really would love to see this whole circuit grow and have multiple layers and help tell cool narratives. And so I'm, I'm 100% in agreement with what you were saying there. And like you're saying, like, it's a great chance to meet people, build community, network. There's a lot of cool people. And I was especially coming out to the U.S. National Championship. You have a lot of guys even near that area to begin with that are content creators and are really into the game. And so they, you can fly in there and meet them along with the kind of CMON reps as well. So when you're going to a tournament, um, how do you approach your list building for like a big event like this? Do you typically try to find out like what the meta is and in, in big air quotes there, or do you build your list like kind of in a vacuum from scratch, just using, you know, your intimate personal knowledge? You know, interestingly for me, it's, um, there's definitely a difference between, you know, playing some of these online things and, uh, and then doing like an in-person thing. I, I just feel like it's, it's a little bit different. And, and some of that is because when you play online, you've got access to everything. Some people in person, you know, they don't have eight units of Raiders to play. So <laughs> you don't you don't always have to list build for things like that. But uh, honestly, for me, I try to do like I try to play something that 
I think a lot of people aren't playing. So when I took Lannisters to the last Gen Con, it was because I felt like, you know, people were kind of down on Lannisters. Uh, everybody was kind of on this Stark train and a little bit into the Free Folk train and Night's Watch always being popular in America. And even at that time, I think the Baratheons with uh, the Heroes boxes, you know, you had Melisandre, you had Renly number two, and these things had kind of picked up steam. So I was like, I think I'm going to play Lannisters because I don't think there will be a lot of Lannisters. And a lot of times for me, that's what ends up happening. I play what I like and what I own that I think people won't bring. And then kind of for Adepticon, it was the same thing. You know, Night's Watch wasn't the popular choice. So I was like, I have these Night's Watch. I want to play Night's Watch. So it's kind of a combination of what I want to play, what I've got kind of painted and what I'm working on. But for the most part, I just try to do something that's a little bit different. I try not to run a super meta e type of list. I try to kind of break off of that and give people a little bit of a surprise in person. So there have been some people calling you Brett the Meta Breaker Land for, you know, you're, you've been one who likes to try new things and experiment and take some risks maybe sometimes in the face of conventional wisdom. So recently there was talk about you experimenting more with two NCUs and finding some success with that. Is that something you could maybe talk about a little bit more? Sure. And and I I think um, just to preface it, there's there's nothing wrong with run, running three NCUs. I know that <laughs> some people think that like there's this thing where people just hate when when people run three NCUs. I it's it's a preference. Um there's definitely a place for it. But but yes, um, uh, Bob Omer and I both ran this exact same Night's Watch list to this NRG event. Um, and what, what is NRG for those maybe just who aren't familiar? And it's Northern Realm, Realms Gaming. So they're very closely affiliated with A Song of Ice and Fire stats. And I, I guess I, I nonchalantly say that name without, without prefacing exactly what they are. But when COVID hit in 2020, you had Northern Realms Gaming with the assistance of A Song of Ice and Fire stats. They put together this uh, tabletop event or this tabletop simulator event. And it was like, well, we're going to bring all of these metas together. It's going to be really the first time that all of the worldwide meta is playing and we're going to use TTS because everybody's locked down. Well, it ended up being wildly successful. It was like a 64 person event. And I think a lot of the community learned so much about the game from that event. As crazy as it is, if you if you go back in your time machine to 1.6, Going into that event, people thought Rob Stark wasn't a good Stark commander. Um, Alan Reed wasn't really very popular. It was like, you know, Brendan Tully and, and things like this were what people thought was like super strong. And then, of course, after this event, the Starks with Rob in particular did so well. You know, you came to find out like, hey, this stuff is really, really good. So it was just a bizarre time. But you brought all of these people together from all around the world. And then we played together and it, it was it, it ended up just being this really big, cool event. Uh, they decided to put another one on this year. It was NRG number two and they kept it at 32 players this time. But um, for me going into it, it was just it just carried that same name like it was going to be this big event because that first NRG event was so groundbreaking and they just did such a good job of putting that together. Like for me, it, it was going to be huge. <laughs> I think maybe I blew it up bigger than what it was in my Facebook post, but I was just elated for, for my friend Bob to win because he and I practiced so hard prior to that event trying things and seeing what worked. And we ended up finding out that Night's Watch can function really well with two NCUs because you've got the conscripts that end up doing even more healing than what Tycho can heal. Mm -hmm. And then you're capable, you know, a lot of times you're seeing with Night's Watch builds, it's four combat units and they've got like the watch captain serving as a pseudo activation, but it's still just one combat drop. And then they're running three NCUs. So it, it's like a total of eight activations, eight pseudo activations, but it's only four combat drops and I've found that it's really, really important when you're deploying for these matches, uh, particularly in the scenarios that involve sitting on tokens where your commanders get two points. It's actually really important to be able to kind of monitor what your opponent's dropping. And then this way you can pick where you drop your units, whether that's, hey, I've got this one big unit. It's going to be my heavy lifting unit. And I want it to take out their heaviest hitter to give me this advantage. You can have that advantage if you've got the 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 advantage in the combat drops if you're dropping five combat units and they're dropping four then obviously you're going to get the last drop whether that's putting your commander away from danger or putting your strong unit across from their strong unit and i think it's really important to take the time to explain things out like that um where you know sometimes people those those debates about ncus can maybe devolve down to 
uh, like yes or no kind of binary statements, but getting in there and really understanding like, well, when is it advantageous? Like what is the ad- advantage of taking three NCUs? And then really understanding it to the point where you can say, well, in some situations, like maybe that's not the right tool. So the deployment yeah. thing being a big piece of that then. Yeah, I think largely, and and maybe I'm wrong with this, but my my thought process behind it, and I, I've talked to some of the, you know, other the stats guys, Carlo and Mickey, they analyze the stats, they analyze this type of data. It's kind of what they do. And it seems like the third NCU is such a popular choice because it's an activation. Now, obviously, it's kind of an elephant in the room, but we're playing a game where that activation advantage matters. There's a whole lot that goes into that, right? You can't just drop nine activations on the table just so that you have nine activations and your opponent has seven. You can't just expect to win. There's synergies and things that go into that. But the NCU being a generally a four-point activation that can't die, that's kind of why uh, three NCU is still popular because hmm. it's it's able to get you like the four really elite units and then those three NCUs to get you to seven activations, or you're able to push, you know, a couple of really strong units, a little bit of support, and then the three NCUs get you to eight. But yeah, I mean, like I'm saying, there is definitely merit to putting bodies on the field. There's definitely merit to winning that deployment. And, and a lot of times, I think, you know, people kind of forget how important that is to be able to get that last drop. And if you're getting the last two drops on your opponent, you're really kind of dictating the flow of the battle from the beginning. And I I think it definitely is important, Um, especially with these reworked scenarios where the commander is so important. If your opponent has, you know, they've paid two points for Vargo Hote and the entire premise of that build and that unit is to kill your commander well if you've got six drops and they've got four they're dropping vargo hope before you drop your commander you can put your commander all the way across the battlefield whereas if it's the opposite situation and vargo's the last person to be dropped like hey he's going across from your commander there's not a lot you can do about it right that makes sense that makes a lot of sense so you know if you wanted to you know part of the fun of games like this is the the tinkering right like building new lists trying different things out and exploring. And so if you wanted to explore other things that maybe aren't necessarily as mainstream at the time, or that maybe some people might be overlooking, or that, hey, you know what, maybe people should just take a few seconds to to look at and, and maybe play a game or two with. You had mentioned earlier before we jumped on here that you've been exploring a little bit with Joffrey in his commander form with Lannister. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think, um, you know, when Joffrey first came out, he's been polarizing from the beginning. Uh, the Kingsguard have been through a couple different versions, but I think when he first came out, for the most part, the take on him was you're going to bring Joffrey for fun. And that's the only reason. And then now the Kingsguard can heal. And so it was like, well, you're still just bringing Joffrey for fun. But it ended up, it ended up being Joffrey was really, really good in 1.6. You gave him a fair shake. And a lot of that hinged around the King's Garden. I don't think that that has changed into 2021. I just think Joffrey's NCU is so good right now. And those red cloaks are just so attractive because they're essentially a long ranged weapon that doesn't shoot, right? They just long range panic bomb you. They are such a cool unit. That's such a cool design, by the way. I just have to mention <laughs> how much I, I love that design, Lannister Justice. They're coming for you, (laughs) but it's so cool. But, uh, you know, Joffrey's NCU is so important in that build because you always want to control the crown or the red cloaks don't really give you any mileage. So my thought was, well, you know, I'm going to go back and look at Joffrey's cards. Is there something that I'm missing? Because in the last version there, his cards had some downside, but his upside was huge. And I was reviewing it, you know, a couple of weeks ago, and I was like, you know what? It hasn't changed. Joffrey's cards are incredible. And I think in the right build, you know, Michael and Fabio did a really nice job of mitigating spike damage and making sure that they controlled some of these combos that can kind of one hit a unit and take them out. The exception is Joffrey. (laughs) He still he still exists in that form. If you go across and you kind of read everybody's tactics cards, it's so rare to just straight at attack dice, you know, through through attachments or anything. They rework, you know, the hold the line that used to add to attack dice. They reworked so many of these things then you go to joffrey's you will obey me you get plus two attack dice and sundering now for each miss you're going to suffer a wound and if you don't destroy the defender you become panicked but 
I feel like that downside for that upside is huge. So I was looking at that and I was like, what nastiness can I play this card on? And it was just like, bam, it's Flademan. <laughs> Flademan charging. It's Flademan. Here we go again. I'm having flashbacks. <laughs> you play this card on Flademan. They're swinging nine dice. If they're charging, it's nine dice with critical blows, vicious, and sundering from Joffrey's card. And then the Flayed Men have their kind of, I call it like super vicious, the additional minus one to the panic test and then a plus one wound for failing. And I was like, yeah, this is incredible. And then I got to thinking, you know, what other synergies can we tie into this? Of course, Cersei, hear me roar. The Flayed Men... You know, if you just kind of look at it, with, when they're charging with that many dice, with that many keywords, you're probably taking, if you don't take a rank off, I'd say you were unlucky. You're probably taking two ranks off, and then Hear Me Roar just pops off. Like, it's a minus six at that point. Minus three from the Flayed Men themselves, and then another minus three from Hear Me Roar, and it's D3 plus two wounds. I was like, these Flayed Men can one-shot a unit. Like, they can go into pretty much anything that's not three plus defense and they're probably wiping them out. So then how are you filling out the rest of this list? And you've got your Kingsguard, which is already like a, a pretty powerful unit at six points. You've got your Flayed Men. You've got Cersei. Yep, so there's a couple of ways you can go with this. Currently, the list looks like this. You've got the Kingsguard with Joffrey, and you've got the Flayed Men. I've got Red Cloaks in there just as a six-point unit. That's something that you could kind of flex put something in there if you wanted to guard with a captain is still a really strong unit you could do some uh, storm crow archers well you know however you want to fill that to taste and then currently i've got the other eight points going to another unit of flayed men <laughs> of course <laughs> oh, all right so it's like if it's not scary enough if you're worried about it over here you should also be worried about it over there you got two threats yep and then my thought process was you know i'm running seven activations it's, you know, not that ideal magic number eight. So you want to round the rest of the list out with a little bit of healing because you want to make sure that, A, your Kingsguard survive because that's a three-point unit. And again, with the um, objectives being so important for your commander, you've got to keep the Kingsguard alive. So I've got Tycho in there as that kind of once per game, save us, Tycho. <laughs> <laughs> Tywin's calling in the his favors at, of the Iron yeah, Bank. Yeah, get that bank, the money guard. flows. <laughs> and then I've got the High Sparrow in the list as well. And the High Sparrow actually has a really nice synergy with Cersei as well, because the High Sparrow's NCU heals you when an opponent fails a panic test. And mm. in case you didn't notice, this entire list focuses on panic, because the Kingsguard themselves have something of uh, a built-in intimidating presence uh, because they can gain Vicious for an attack. And then if you fail the panic test, they suffer an additional wound. So ideally, now this is the dream combo, right? These things never end up happening. But ideally in my head, I was like, okay, so we can play Vicious on the Kingsguard. If they attack an enemy that's engaged with Flayed Men, the Flayed Men's intimidating presence adds a wound. The Kingsguard add a wound. And then Hear Me Roar adds a wound. So you can stick oh, them for a you can stick them for a D3 plus three panic test. Yeah, that's pretty brutal. Yeah, and it's an, another thing that I was keeping in mind with that was, <laughs> you know, I don't have Joffrey's NCU, and I'm not running Peter Baelish right now. So I've got Cersei in the list kind of to incentivize. I'm trying to bring back the Cersei crown bomb. I think it's a thing. Ooh, okay. She can, she can claim the crown and then immediately grab Hear Me Roar. Well, I think some people don't, maybe initially recognize that Flademan's intimidating presence works if they're engaged with you. It doesn't have to be the Flademan attacking. So if you crown attack something, well, I say crown attack, it's obviously right. not an attack, but if you crown zap somebody engaged with Flademan, they're doing a minus two and they're doing D3 plus one if they fail. Now you can add a hear me roar to that. And then from the tactics board, you can get up to a minus five and wow. D3 plus two wounds just because they're engaged with the flayed men. Now I know you're a free folker and I, I, yeah. <laughs> love, I love the bone Lords chosen, but it's, it's a similar thing to them. You know, if the crown's open, just keep in mind, you know, the, the intimidating presence will stack with the crown modified. So if you just, for everybody, PSA for everybody, <laughs> if you hadn't thought about it, when you take the crown and you zap a unit that's engaged with one of your units with intimidating presence, those, they work together. That's fantastic, man. We're making the crown bomb a thing. <laughs> yeah, man, it's back, baby. All right, so then you've got, so you've got Kingsman with Joffrey, you've got two units of House Bolt and Flayed Men, you've got your Red Cloaks unit, Cersei Lannister, Tycho, and the High Sparrow. So if you're listening, 
maybe uh, if you're someone especially who's really been attached to running your your Joffrey NCU, consider maybe taking this for a spin and and switching things up. Uh, In fact, actually, it might be fun to hear if people uh, find success with this or if they maybe switch the red cloaks out and they're putting other things in and finding even more success. It might be interesting to hear, you know, what what you guys are doing with that and, and, and how it's working out. So make sure when we post this, we'll post it on social media if you're in the On The Table Gaming Facebook group. You know, let us know there how you're switching it up and 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 how it's working with this sort of uh this brett uh meta breaker list you can join the the meta breaker ranks and uh see how it goes i'd love to hear about it because i think i think he's still just a little bit underrated and i think i think there's some merit you know switch some things around there's coolest thing about lannisters right now and why they're my favorite faction to play is i i don't even think i've cracked the surface there's so many cool things that you can do with lannisters there's so many cool like sub builds that you can do. The Kingsguard attachments are so unique. I haven't even had the opportunity to down with with all of the potential that the Lannisters have. So definitely, this is a rough draft. Feel free to change it up how you want. I want to hear how people do, but I would love to hear about uh, Joffrey making his way back to the top of the ranks. The, the, the I guess as some people say, the one true king. I don't know. The Joffrey in the in the lore was always <laughs> kind of a little bit of a brat. So well, I'm not sure I could support that. But you know, we'll see. Yeah, um, we'll see. So this would be kind of a fun thing we'll take out for a spin and uh, give some feedback on. And then, you know, in addition to all of this stuff, today was uh, was a big day because there was a lot of other additional information, uh, kind of, I guess I should say revealed, but maybe spoiled or leaked. Maybe those are strong words, but uh, posted online for a variety of new units, the Silenced Men, the House Karstark Spearmen, the Clegane Butchers, Drogo's Blood Riders, the Thornwatch Ranger Vanguards, uh, the Free Folk Frozen Chariots. So those are posted online. And it's kind of like a little bittersweet. Uh, and so I, I, while I am excited to talk about them and, and give some you know thoughts and impressions, it's tough because this is right on the heels of Simon talking about how they want to uh, do more and make a bigger commitment to speaking to the community. And and having events where they talk about and reveal and spoil things and, and, and you know, to have so much information kind of get dumped out there before the product is scheduled to arrive with distributors, you know, that that kind of makes that a little bit more challenging. And, you know, it's a little bit of a bummer because it looks like it's going to be a, a light in terms of news for quarter three now because uh, we got all this information up front. You know, it's going to be wild for that product to make its way to actual distributors and stores so kind of a kind of a little bittersweet but it's you know these things that happened in the past and i'm sure simon's working to address it but let's you know let's jump in and talk about some of these units that we have seen now uh, were there any ones in particular that stood out to you that you're excited about oh my god the blood riders the blood riders are so good i can't i can't believe they're eight points what? So what? that's fantastic <laughs> that's like you know especially for bringing like a, a dothraki themed force so I've yeah. just begun to dabble with Targaryens. Over COVID, I was painting them up and uh, started getting some games with them. And so I am by far not an accomplished Targaryen player. So, you know, in looking at these, I've had a lot of fun with Dothraki veterans. And I like the idea of running like a, a Khal Drogo, you know, Dothraki themed force. What what are the, you know, at eight points, are these going to be replacing veterans? What kind of, how do they serve a different role here? They Oh, they are just a tank. Um, the veterans definitely have more offensive potential, so it's going to depend on, you know, what your goals are. I, I'm not necessarily entirely sure that they're, I'm not entirely sure that they're just like this auto include unit. They are very, very, very good. Don't get me wrong. Um, with Cal Drogo bringing iron resolve to the table, you're looking at effectively a morale four cavalry unit. That's also three plus defense. They end up being pretty substantially more defensive offensive than flayed men and they're fast their movement six so i think these guys are really 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 good but um you're locking yourself out of some of those attachments who are also really 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 nice and then again you know um veterans veterans are so good they just yeah. throw <laughs> so many dice and i think the thing is they've done such a good job of designing call drogo i don't think it matters what unit he's in if he's in flayed men if you go the budget build and put him in Screamers, um, if he's in Dothraki Veterans, or now if he's in the Blood Riders, when you're facing a Dothraki Horde, you don't want anything to do with Khal Drogo. Mm-hmm. Not only because, you know, he's hard to kill and he's bringing the pain with whatever unit he's in, but it's that expert duelist. 
Um, yeah. And that's such an important addition to this. I mean, it, it existed before, of course, but um, the, this like, this character, the idea of attachment and, and a character assassination is so important in 2021. So important that I think um, my, my bold prediction for upcoming meta stuff, I think you might start seeing Jock and Hagar, the huh. attachment. Jock and Hagar, because if your if your character is unfortunately assassinated, you can bring him back with Jock and Hagar. But additionally, if you haven't read his rules, I think the coolest thing, like thematically, about Jock and Hagar's attachment is once he replaces the attachment, like let's say I was talking to Bob about this, and I was thinking it would be super cool to run Call Drogo and then throw Jock and Hagar in a unit, and then you go and assassinate one of their characters with Call Drogo, and then you steal them with Jock and Hagar. So you've got Call Drogo in the same list with Jock and Hagar, and then whatever head Call Drogo goes and collects, Jock and Hagar can turn into them. But the coolest thing about Jock and, and and maybe some people have overlooked that is the new attachment picks up the order taking a new name. Right. So that means <laughs> Like it's they can never be, ending. <laughs> right. They can be a champion of faith because that's the first head that Call Drogo collected. And then if he goes and, you know, decapitates Tyrion as well, now the champion of faith can turn into Tyrion. Or yeah. <laughs> if one of your attachments dies and you like that one better, it can turn into that. Like it's actually really, really cool. And uh, Bob and I were just talking about it. I was like, I can't believe I haven't tried this. Because it just looks fun, just thematically, and just just thinking about it from a fun ass. This just looks fun. Yeah. This 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 one point attachment, uh, who's technically free, right? If he's in Stormcrow Mercenaries, he can be anybody you want to be. <laughs> it's awesome. You can. It's very inspiring, really. It's like you can grow up and be anyone you want to be, as long as Cal Drogo cuts their head up for you. Exactly. So you know, I'm just this is dorky, but I'm also just excited with the Blood Riders because uh, I just like seeing all the Thraki on the table. So not necessarily having to reach for my Bolton forces to get that three plus save, just being able to be like, have that natively in house. I'm, I'm yeah. also excited by that. <laughs> and I, well, I think you should be excited for all Dothraki builds. Um, I was actually just before you and I talked, I was talking to my co-host on small council radio, Craig, who's tinkering around with some build and we kind of landed on a call Drogo build that it's all Dothraki. And <laughs> He was like, well, what do you think about this version? I was I love it. It's all Dothraki. I don't think you can go wrong. And I think those Harakars are being criminally underused. So I'm hoping Craig makes a little bit of noise with the Harakars. Let's do it, Craig. No pressure. But let's let, blow the lid off. Let's go. Yeah. I think the all Dothraki builds are so cool. They're so fast. Um, if you think about it now, even with the Blood Riders, every Dothraki unit is movement six. That's insane. I remember when you and Colin and I talked about uh, the Targaryens when they first came out, we talked about having to have your special Targaryen rulers. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, they're just, <laughs> they're just so, yeah, they're just so fast. All of them are capable of move marching 18 inches. I mean, they can essentially be wherever they want on the battlefield, and the Harakars are no exception. Their movement six with the free cavalry maneuver. I think one of the drawbacks of this new uh, Targaryen hero box is going to be when your opponent asks you, which which attachment do you have in that unit? And you're like, oh, that's, uh, is it Quatho <laughs> or like Coholio, Co Coholo? Cornholio, it's uh, <laughs> you're gonna be you're gonna have to remember how to say all these different names. I might like write them phonetically out just so I can get them right. Yeah, you might have to ask for a pronunciation. Otherwise, you just refer to them as, oh, this is the intimidating presence guy. Right. And that's kind of building <laughs> off what you were just talking about in your Joffrey list. So it's exciting to get that and have that be put into units to, yeah. to give your cavalry intimidating presence and, and prey on fear. Well, it's absolutely um, synergizes so well with the aforementioned uh, Harakars. Mm -hmm. Because the Harakars can outflank. Um, they're super mobile being on that war machine tray. Um, you get them in the rear of somebody that's engaged with intimidating presence. It's a minus five panic test. That's that's like ouch. That's a lot of pain. And then that's what's... Lannister level panic modification. <laughs> There's a lot to be afraid of. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> uh, so when you take this, it's basically like a Kingsguard unit, right? So when you take this unit of cavalry, um, you put Caldrogan as a commander, and then the other three Blood Riders. 
gosh, I wish I could say the names right. Quatho, Koholo, and Hago. I'm butchering those. But those three are, you know, then part of that unit. Uh, and then Rakaro, you can actually put out in other units. And he's got the ability Sentinel. So after a friendly unit's long range is attacked, the unit performs a charge or maneuver action, having to charge the attacker. Um, they've also got Elusive Escape. They can reroll retreat distance and put out a weakened token when they disengage. So you have the three that have to be with Caldrogo, and then you have this one that you can kind of float around, but can really be a nice like kind of companion unit then getting ready to charge in and support. Didn't we just talk about how mobile Targaryens are? Yeah. <laughs> now you got the two last of them. thing they need is a, <laughs> a free maneuver, right? Sentinel Sentinel in a Dothraki unit is I mean, that's a disgusting amount of mobility they're already fast enough it's tough though because that that unit that eight point unit's pretty cool uh and it's nice to have a little bit tankier unit especially you get cal in there it's a killer um but then these three attachments are pretty pretty amazing that you're losing out on um and they yeah. are only two points each and i say only i mean that you get a lot for what you get there especially in a mobile force like the targaryens Oh, absolutely. I think the one that I maybe, maybe I underestimate, but I always find ch- a little bit more challenging is the order uh, to the last. That's the one where you have to perform a, a morale test when you're destroyed, or you get to perform a morale test when you're destroyed, or, or would be destroyed. And on a success, you're not destroyed, but you get to stay and play with one wound. And yeah. then you become panicked and vulnerable. You get those tokens on it. You got to like be carefully lined up so that you can like either A, heal that unit right away, or like have them stop taking damage. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, it goes back to to 1.6, my, my days of playing Jon oh, Snow. Snow. <laughs> it's kind of like it shall not end until my death. And I know you kind of wanted to play that card on John, if possible, because it had synergy with his indomitable order. But I don't think anybody that probably so many people have PTSD from <laughs> Jon Snow's It Shall Not End Until My Death. And now you have some of some of uh, you've got Corn Half Hand, you've got the Kingsman and the Queensman. And, and these are just abilities that happen all the time. And I know it screwed up so many games for my opponent when I played It Shall Not End. Um, I think it's a really good ability. I know they become panicked and vulnerable, but you do have um, in the case of Targaryens, you've got Illyrio, who's essentially the money bag zone without removing the token. So you've got healing on a stick with him, but nearly everybody, um, unless free folk have uh, a version of to the last, which I don't think they, they don't do at this time. Not that, I, at not that I'm aware of, time. but at everybody this else time. I've got to always leave it open. You know, everybody else has access to Tycho. So uh, Tycho is a thing. Tycho is really, really good. Um, I struggle to not include him in a list just because his emergency healing is just so good but it it has very strong synergy with keeping a unit alive (laughs) and then you know they attack you you live yay i'm not dead and then (laughs) they're they're thinking they're licking their chops looking at this unit that's got one wound left and then you tycho bomb them and there they are back up even worse if it's a tycho bomb and then the money bag i've healed eight (laughs) <laughs> or when you horribly misplay and it doesn't get off like that, <laughs> which is not the case I've had for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's a dice that's roll. That's where you learn your skill. You know, you, you, you build your mastery. <laughs> yeah, it, it can happen. I, I just still think it's a cool ability. Um, and the Dothraki are all super high morale. They're definitely above average morale with yes. all of their units. So um, you're looking at generally a morale five across the board. So it's pretty strong. Uh, Call Drogo's got lead by example too, which gives you plus two to morale tests for the remainder of the round. So I think there's definitely some strong synergy there. Um, you get lead by example, maybe even kind of recklessly throw that unit out there, knowing that, um, even if you've got to take a follow up panic test after the attack, it's effectively going to be on a three because of lead by example. So there's definitely some play there. And then I know I've been super excited about the the free folk f- frozen chariots. And I was before I was just you know waxing poetic about the sculpt and the and the uh, just having that kind of a cool unit. But at four points, there's no limits. It's kind of an interesting choice. I thought it was going to be coming in around five or so. And um, you know, four points that's pretty compelling. I mean, it is fragile for sure. And I'm missing out on an attachment. But, you know, there's there's a lot of like, you know, minor synergies, I think, you know, with with really most of the two point attachments and free folk, whether it's, you know, uh, what is it? War Cry on Giant Spain on Tormund or, you know, what Mark Target with Ygritte. Like, so those will be fun just being able to zip around and, and strike where needed. Yeah, no, they're a super cool unit. I am incredibly 
happy that we've got chariots in this game. Um, and of course, <laughs> of course, it had to be for free folk. Um, That's right. The, yeah, the we wolf take up, but we I get mean, chariots. That's the thing. <laughs> yeah, you can't. You can't even not talk about the sculpt either. I mean, what? Oh my that gosh. Is a, that oh, is an that, amazing wolf chariot. And that's going to be something you can do conversions on. Anything that has a little, uh, a little basket like that on the back. I'm excited. Absolutely. <laughs> I've got I maybe Mr. Someone, Tormund I can put on there. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I saw somebody mentioning um, in terms of other game systems, you know, you've got the goblins from, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, from Warhammer. It would make a really neat goblin wolf chariot. But uh, regardless, it, it, it's such a cool unit. And uh, yeah, I think you nailed it. The four point price tag, you know, at first it's like, man, these guys are really cheap. They're, people are going to spam them. But I don't think they've got the sustain really. No. That you're not going to make an army of chariots. They don't have enough sustain. I feel like that's so, not the core of your force for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a pretty cool, well balanced unit. It's going to come in as a support unit, it's going to hurt. A lot <laughs> if, it, if it gets into the proper positioning but um i don't have the card in front of me is it uh is it a monster or a cavalry unit it is a war machine oh it's a war machine okay uh so it doesn't necessarily you know synergize with anything we we're trying to press fabio on on the last episode and he was kind of cryptic and he's like well we, we've done this on purpose to future proof things which may have just meant like they purposely limited it from other things coming down the road or maybe that means like there's something special about war machines. I'm not really sure. Um, but, you know, honestly, the the plus one hits uh, based on the defender's ranks. Like, I, I'm having failed many a four plus to hit. I'm all about the automatic hits. That's part of the reasons I really enjoy spear wives at this time. And then, you know, the ability to, if you do survive, you manage to survive uh, with their their six wounds on, on uh, five plus armor, they can make that free retreat action. At least it means that you can potentially, you know, especially with a, a weakened token, you can potentially, uh, you know, weather an attack, get out there, maybe soak up a unit's activation and uh, reposition yourself for like another hit on something else. Yeah, I think they've got, I think they've definitely got some play with a uh, Tormund as well, because this is a unit that you want to be charging as much as possible. Yeah. And Tormund brings a uh, counter assault to the table. So I don't want to get ran over by a chariot because I attacked <laughs> something. <laughs> like, <laughs> I did a good thing. I was supposed to attack them to win this game and I got ran over for it. As it should be. Um, exactly. And then, you know, we got some a few other units going out here. The Ranger Vanguard. Well, we've t- spoken a little bit of them. Now we know that they are indeed seven points. That looks like a fun unit. We definitely enjoy how it synergizes with um, the rest of the Ranger keywords, which I will be seeing in the Night's Watch Hero Box 2 which is what you know Fabio was saying on stream for Simon Expo to watch out for. So it seems like there'll be a, a cool way to use them, but they also kind of complete the package of Night's Watch Cavalry, where you've got you know all sorts of different tokens you can be throwing out as you're riding around. Yeah, and initially, I think you remember from seeing the the pictures of my army, the my entire Night's Watch army is is converted to be like a Ranger army. So yes. you know that I'm very excited for the prospect. <laughs> of running some type of all ranger army i've got my trackers that i absolutely love and then now i've got a a proper designated melee um ranger unit to go with my hunters and my trackers and um you know so we'll see what kind of really cool ranger affiliation we get from heroes box too but it's pretty exciting because uh i am just really loving the ranger hunters right now i'm running them with john snow uh, it would be super cool if I could put a properly themed character in there and yes. run a proper Ranger army because I am loving the Rangers right now. And speaking of cavalry, what did you think of the uh, Clegane Brigand? Oh, I think they're fantastic. Those models are beautiful as well. Um, they do like have that gruff quality to them. They're adding something to the Lannisters that they've kind of lacked before. I mean, you've you've got Flayed Men and Knights of Castle Rock, but unless you were reaching for Zorse Riders... Uh, you never really had a unit that was this fast. You know, the Starks have their Outriders. Uh, the Night's Watch have always had a movement six cavalry. Uh, all of the Dothraki are super fast, you know, so it's they're an interesting unit for the Lannisters. I think they're a finesse unit. They're definitely not, or you don't want to just send them head first into the fray. These guys are definitely the cleanup crew, but I think um, if you can get them in the proper position and if you can get some things to work out for them, they are going to be a nasty, nasty cleanup crew. They're probably going to break some hearts with that really, really nasty, vicious attack plus the extra wounds. So 
yeah, it's going to be pretty gross. It'll be nice just, you know, messing around with them with the Clegane affiliation, throwing out assault orders on them, things like that to, to catch your opponent off guard. Yeah, absolutely. It's Yeah, it's going to hurt really bad. Yeah, that was another thing that the Clegane builds always lacked. You could run the Flademen or the Knights of Castle Rock in that Clegane build just to kind of take advantage of um, maybe an overrun or just have that cavalry mobility, but now you've got uh, full access to the free charge with assault orders. And uh, I think overrun now, you can reroll your charge distance if you're House Lannister. Go look it up. Yes. If this targets a House Clegane unit, it may reroll any charge distance, which is pretty substantial. Yeah. I think everybody's, everybody's like, all right, charging on a two plus. And, it's and there's a one. kind of the obvious synergy there with the Clegane Butcher. Um, although that, that starts getting up there in price. It does start getting up there in price. The Clegane Butcher, I still want to see somebody um, do like a, a massive chain panic with a bunch of spread fear. <laughs> like some spread fear from the uh, from the Dreadfort captain. Or is it there, the go, there go my Raiders. Bye. <laughs> yeah, you can really create a massive chain panic. Like it's... Um, it can bounce from unit to unit. If you've got those attachments working, I want somebody to do it. It's a challenge for everybody listening. And then uh, the silenced men. That's a really cool piece from the lore. You're having their tongues cut out so they don't reveal any secrets from um, Euron's ship. These guys are coming in five plus armor, but they got sundering. Their their uh, pillage allows them to suffer negative one wound from failing panic tests for each pillage token on the unit. And then while in short range, enemies suffer negative one to the morale test. So it's like a reverse bubble where it's, you know, draining morale of one on all enemies within short range. That's pretty amazing. And it's per token. So that's a minus two on everyone in short range when they're, when they're loaded up. It actually, I think, it, I think it can get pretty gross. I think, I think some initial reactions are people bulking at the seven point price tag for a unit that has a five plus defense, but they do have, have five plus morale which is pretty substantial and then i think you're playing these guys as that support unit to chuck out those those modifiers to morale because the harlow reapers oh. can get really really nasty when you fail panic tests and they've got the pillage tokens but just the 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 Greyjoy unit having Sundering innately is really nice. Of course, you've got that with your uh, Reavers, but these guys are bringing the Sundering to help get get some of those pillage tokens out. But they're they're really like a support unit. They're they're kind of like a buff wagon for everything else that you've got working. Because despite the fact that they changed Panic to just do D3 wounds now, they went and started adding things like intimidating presence. You've got the Lannister and the Free Folk adding wounds for failing panic tests. Panic is still really, really nasty. So the fact that they've got their own built-in panic resistance is pretty substantial because still, and I've played a lot of games in the 2021 version, and still, you those panic tests are just so punishing. And I'm really a big fan of Iron Resolve, so I'm going to be a fan of these guys uh, being able to possibly reduce it by two. Uh, it really takes the wind out of the sails of some of these factions that are banking on panic damage to to really push push the kills through. It can be really hard to kill things that always pass panic. And honestly, I'm just really uh, thrilled at the way Greyjoys are shaping up. You know, they're the, the newest kids on the block. I feel like each of their units, this will be their sixth unit, um, has a real personality and is really interesting. And I'm just glad to see more tools being added to the toolbox. Chase, they are so good and they're so cool. <laughs> I just finished my last tournament game. I, I played Greyjoys and they're explosive potential you know when they start to get the ball rolling when they've got the pillage tokens when things start to work out for them they can do some really nasty stuff um dakota actually roll them if you got them dakota yeah. he was who i played and i think he popped three of my night's watch units in one round it was the very last round he got victarian off of a really nasty assault orders charge into ghost did an overrun into conscripts blew up the conscripts and then on the other side of the field he charged with uh asha and iron makers and then he had another assault orders <laughs> he blew up he actually blew up john snow like john snow's ranger unit i was like oh my god <laughs> what just happened i was i was i was I think it was like eight to four or something and i was pretty well set to win and and yeah no it ended up 11 to 10 uh the Greyjoys have some really cool stuff up, up their sleeve 
and the amount of sustain that that army has with all of the healing and then with having um, effectively it shall not end until my death uh, in their deck you know they can really stick around longer than you think they would you you would think that they would explode and they wouldn't have sustain but they really do have it they are fun I think I'm going to have to bite the bullet and, and, and look into them they're just they just seem so fun and neat to me and then we got the thorn watch for Baratheon and those are coming at seven points that's a lot of stiff competition there and it seems like you know initially some people have been kind of down about this i'm excited to see how they shape out and you know what synergies people start finding for them the sculpts look fantastic i love the way they're kind of like casually dressed they all look very like suave (laughs) yeah they they are fantastic sculpts i think uh you and Simon and I kind of talked about it and, and yeah. the drowned men were my absolute favorite, but the, these, these guys were very, very close. It still looks like a unit that's going to be very easy to misplay and, and uh, mess up. Yeah. I've, I haven't had the chance to really, really look at them. Uh, Baratheons have never really been my faction of choice. Um, that's okay. Because it seems like, like everybody and their, their mother has a copy of Baratheons. Like I feel like that's the most frequently found faction for me to be able to play against. So I'm sure I will face them in various types of lists, competitive and non-competitively assembled. I, I predict some free folks shot up with arrows, but boy, I'll try and chase them down. <laughs> Oh, maybe I'll just hit him with my chariots and be like, come on. <laughs> Those chariots are definitely going to be interesting. Probably maybe the most intriguing thing that came out of this little spoiled batch or however you want to call it. But uh, man, I, I want to see what people do with them. Yeah. And then there was also the car- House Car Star Experiment, which I believe we've also spoken about in the past, which came in at six points. You know, make some tough choices there. And uh you know, I think they're a unit I certainly want to explore. They're just, they're super tanky, dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're a two plus, two plus defense from an infantry unit, but they've also got the uh, hold your ground ability where if they're only engaged with one unit, they're not getting flank, charge, or rear bonuses. Like, if you're charging these guys and they've got their bulwark formation on, I think a lot of things are just going to bounce. They're just going to bounce them. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's going to be fun trying to figure out how to play them versus maybe, say, the House Tally Sworn Shields. I think kind of, you know, you can say it's boring or lame or whatever. I think these guys want to be like the ultimate objective keeper. That or the ultimate like center anchor for an army. Um, because technically they they can activate without taking an action. So you don't have to break that bulwark formation. So if you've got them sitting on the center token, um, particularly if you've got a commander in them, like, uh, like Tolly, who's going to take them up to a four plus morale and they're going to heal when they pass a panic test, which I believe what he does now. I'm not as well versed as I'd love to be. I think he's got dauntless and stalwart. So him in a unit like this, just sitting in the center of the field, racking up two points, uh, they don't, really have to do anything and they'll stay at that two plus save and unless you're getting multiple multiple units tar pitted into them then they're gonna cancel your charge flank and rear bonuses that leaves you sundering that's all you've got to get through their defense unless you're engaged with more than one unit you don't have any other way to modify their their armor (laughs) that's pretty nasty man it's gonna be so fun there's gonna be some epic moments of that yeah and the other thing you'll only be able to modify their morale with like vicious and other things like that because you won't get the negative one or the negative two for being in the flank or rear because of stand your ground. So they might have a play and they're also movement five. So typically you associate these heavily defensive units with like a movement four, but you know what? That's something I just totally forgot about. And that's a really good point. Actually trying to get to objectives to sit on them. Yeah. That that extra, you know, when you March that adds up pretty quickly. Yeah. Well, Starks have a switch reposition. So um, you can get them. I think so what all of the objectives now for the most part are like, your deployment starts at 10 inches. So Mm -hmm. the objective would be like 14 inches away. So I guess they couldn't move March right onto it, but uh, you can definitely get the the horse for the free maneuver and get them on. Whereas a a movement four unit still can't get there. This has been the faction that I'm, I'm kind of eyeing the most now after Targaryens is maybe free folk Targaryens. And then just getting into Starks more. I've been loving the she bears, the, the, these sculpts look amazing. Just looks like an army. Maybe I'll just focus on like trying to paint up nice and, and get some fun games in with. The she bears are so amazing. <laughs> the sculpts, the sculpts are definitely super nice. Um, I wish I could name drop him, but uh, 
I think it was Mark Ridge, wasn't it, that just finished painting oh, up yeah. the She Bears? Yes. It was so good. And I know oh, that stuff looks people, good, but man, the She Bears. A, a lot of people have been have been painting them up and posting them. And I, I wish I had track of everybody's name to give them the credit. But anybody who's listening, if you if you're painting up the She Bears, we want to keep seeing the flood of uh painted She Bears because I love I love those models so much, and that is such a cool unit. I think Mark Ridge might do commission work. I've got to see. I've got. I got to reach out to him and see what he's up to. Yeah, he's such a nice guy. He's actually local to me. He's been to the store before. You guys have lots of awesome people local, man. Whew. <laughs> The Midwest. Yeah, seriously. Well, for anyone going out there for the U.S. Nationals, hopefully you get to meet some of these people. And, uh, Brett, you know, I think we maybe start to wrap things up here. Uh, thanks for coming on and, and talking about this Joffrey list, about U.S. Nationals, and then you know, just giving some quick off-the-cuff thoughts about the units that we saw today. Best of luck this weekend, too. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it should be really, really fun. <laughs> now there's a chance I, to win some swords and hammers and stuff, so we'll see uh, see what happens. <laughs> Yeah, I was. <laughs> I Everyone said, keep I your think... police blotters on and listen for uh, a man with a sword yeah. was seen walking around. <laughs> I think it's safe to assume that with uh, with uh, Mr. Publicity Chris Tran there, I love that guy. There'll be some pictures. There will oh, be boy. Some pictures and some updates. And I think he was going to reach out to Robert to ask about doing some recording. I already know from previous events that Shane does not mind at all when Chris sets everything up. So you'll look forward to some streams. But, oh, I can't uh, wait. We'll, we're going to spam you with some pictures. And uh, what you got to do is you, you need to start instead of giving out swords and hammers at those events, since Chris does so well, you got to start giving out like apparel, right? So maybe some like really fancy sleeves that he could wear for a shirt and you could have, and then you can, you know, he could start to slowly you could gather a, you know, a wardrobe here of champion items. Yeah. I think he needs some real <laughs> shoes too. Cause he, I think the last two times I've seen him, he's worn sandals or like flip flops or something. It's a style. I feel like he pulls up and look really well as this turns into like a, a fashion podcast here. Chris, we love you, man. <laughs> He does. He pulls it off. We do love you, Chris. And, uh, you know, so on that note, all that loving kindness out there, let's uh, let's wrap things up. And so, you know, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. And in the meantime, we hope you get your miniatures on the table.